about this documentary. Where did you first hear about this case and when did you decide that this would be the perfect subject for a documentary? Well, uh, it all started with the book that I wrote about the case, uh, which came out in October 2018, uh, also called The Ask King. And that all stemmed from my first book, which came out three years before that. That one's called Death on the Devil's Teeth. And similar to the Casso case that's chronicled in The Acid King, um, Death on the Devil's Teeth was about a sort of proto-satanic panic case that happened here uh, in the States over in New Jersey where I grew up. It was uh, the story that had become so obscure over the years that a lot of people thought it was an urban legend. It was back in 1972, this girl, Jeanette De Palma, had gone hitchhiking. Uh, she vanished for six weeks, and then in a really gruesome development, a dog ended up bringing home uh, her arm bone, which led to a search party, and eventually her remains were found on top of this cliff in the woods. And this cliff had been known by this nickname amongst the local kids as the Devil's Teeth. So that was, as if that wasn't spooky enough, all of a sudden there were these rumors in town, well, she was sacrificed by a coven of witches, and then the other half of the rumor mill was saying, oh no, it was Satanists. And while researching the whole Satanic Panic while working on that first book, I came across Ricky's story. And it on the surface was just this really compelling tale of this lost kid in the 80s who had supposedly been this, uh, you know, uh, high school football jock who supposedly started doing drugs and listening to Ozzy and he went crazy and started a cult and started grave robbing and eventually murdered a friend of his and was leading tours to the body, and I just couldn't believe I had never heard of this case before. I'd heard of a lot of other satanic panic cases growing up, but not necessarily this one. And I I, kind of kept it in the back of my head that, well, this would be uh, an interesting story to tell if uh, I ever got the chance to do another uh, true crime book. And that chance came very quickly after the public of uh, Death on the Devil's Teeth, uh, my agent was having lunch with an editor over at Simon & Schuster Pub, and she asked him, you know, would Jesse be interested in writing this book for this new true uh, true crime line that we're working on? We only ask that the case he picks be teenager-centric because we want to market this um, towards high schoolers. And uh, immediately I thought of that case. And I I submitted a a proposal and a sample chapter, and they said, great, you know, uh, this fits in with what we're trying to do. Go write your book. And once I was off and running, it really turned into this separate story of everything I thought I knew about this case was, by and large, wrong or completely exaggerated. Uh, There was a previous book about this case in 1987 called Say You Love Satan by a guy named David St. Clair. And for a lot of people, uh, originally myself included, um, it was the definitive telling of it. And that was one of the things that sort of intimidated me. It was like, well, there's already been this one book. I better make sure I bring something new to the table. And what that ended up being was All of Gary's friends and Ricky's friends telling me, well, you know, that book is all made up, right? It's all bullshit. And I had no idea. So it became a tale of giving a story that had been snatched away from this community of teenagers who were traumatized by this horrific murder and, and, and giving it back to them by letting them tell the story firsthand through my book. And it led to the documentary because, you know, this case, while it's not a, um, a household name by, by any stretch of the imagination, people who are in that world of the satanic panic and true crime and heavy metal, um, it's legendary in those circles. Yeah. So by the time it was announced that I was doing this, this Ricky Casso book, um, I had producers reaching out to me saying, we want, we want the rights to the book. We want to make a docu-series. And I was like, well, the book's not done yet. It was just announced. I mean, I'm still writing it. They're like, oh, it doesn't matter. This happens all the time. And I, I had gotten into some serious discussions with a few of these people, but it became clear to them, uh, I, it became clear to me that 
all they wanted to do was hype up the Satan stuff and exaggerate things, even when they knew it wasn't true. Like, I would explain to these people, like, oh, well, I I'm interviewing the people that were actually involved in this story and, and you know, the police officers that worked the case, etc. And there was no satanic cult in Northport. This was a drug murder. You know that, right? But, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we need to tell the producers and the executives at the networks that this was a teenage satanic cult because that's what's going to get them to buy this project. And then, you know, once we get started, we'll, we'll try and tell the real story. And I was like, oh, that, that doesn't sound good to me. I, 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 I smelled bad news there. Yeah. So while I'm, I'm not a documentarian by trade, I did have the, um, I guess you want to say the upper hand of, Knowing a lot of very, very talented people, whether it be cinematographers, editors, sound people, uh, researchers, etc., that I thought, well, if I could get all of these people together and we could raise a small budget, we could really make an interesting story here that would kind of keep the sharks at bay. Yeah. You know, the types of people that would want to, oh, let's make a Ricky Castle story, Teenage Death Cult. Oh, someone else is already making one. Ah, forget it. Let's go move on. Which is exactly what happened. When when I put the kibosh on one of the deals, the, the guy that wanted to turn this into a docu-series at one point, he went and took another high-profile murderer and made a series for Netflix where he tried saying he was part of a devil cult, and it got completely laughed off the face of the earth. Yeah. So... It, it, it became, it, it wasn't so much that, like, man, I would really love to see this on the screen. It was we are in a race against time here to make sure that this story is told properly. Otherwise, someone else is going to get a hold of it, and it's going to be the satanic panic all over again. Yeah. So I just really wanted to make a film that, that told the true story, featuring the people who lived it, to kind of put it to rest, I guess. Jesse, how difficult is it to sort out the fact from fiction? Because, of course, one of the most high-profile murder cases ever here in Australia was the Port Arthur Massacre. And the day the day after that massacre happened, all of these photos were released by the press here um, of Martin Bryant, the killer. And their problem was, apparently, we found out in later years, their editors said to them, this guy looks too normal. You need to do something to make him look different. So some of our leading newspapers actually photoshopped his photo and put red eyes on his photo to make it to make him look more evil and as we found out now nearly 20 years later a lot of the stories that went around about him were false um he was he was a troubled guy mentally um but the reasons for him doing the massacre were not the reasons we were told at the time but those reasons have now become folklore so if you ask somebody in the street why did martin bryant do the port arthur massacre we hear all the stories that were fleshed out at that time that were all untrue. So how do you, as a researcher, then find out what is fact and what is fiction for these cases that, that have happened like a couple of decades ago? Well, uh, the interesting thing, um, before I go into that, the, the parallels there, like with the photos, um, the, one of the things that really gave the Casso case legs, not just here in the States, but all over the world, uh, was they had a picture to work with that suited their needs so well. This was a kid who had been homeless for four years from age 13 to 17, which was how old he was when he was arrested. He was 40 pounds underweight. I mean, the, the, the kid's hair was all greasy and, you know, he's just out of his mind on PCP when he's arrested. But in a uh, almost comical twist of fate, he was arrested for this this killing that the police and the press were all too happy to uh, label a satanic sacrifice in an ACDC shirt with a picture of the devil on it. Yeah. By total coincidence, the shirt wasn't even his. He borrowed it from a friend of his after he fell into Northport Harbor one day. So, you know, once the press release was sent out about this and the Associated Press here in America picked it up, it was this complete package that worked for it was, oh my God, look at this scary kid growling at the camera wearing an ACDC shirt. They didn't have to do anything to it. You know, whereas we see later in the States, like with OJ Simpson, when he was arrested, they upped the contrast on his booking photo to make him look blacker, as a lot of people uh, pointed out uh, during the whole racial 
discussion of the, uh, the, socio- the sociological aspects of that case. So with this story, you got the complete package. It was, oh my God, here's this, this crazy kid. He not only is a drug addict, he's a drug dealer. He's into the occult. He's got the ACDC shirt on. He's wild out of his mind on drugs to the point where when we tried to take a picture of him going into his arraignment, he just growled at us. So, like, everybody got to basically sit back and be lazy with it. Oh, yeah, double kid. Sure, here you go. Yeah, I heard someone, uh, you know, in Northport, Long Island, where this happened. I heard they said that he went into the woods to talk to Satan. Good. No one really dug deeper in this case until a guy by the name of David Breskin, a 26-year-old journalist from Rolling Stone, came to town and worked on the story, which we chronicle in the book and the film as well. But um, as far as how do you go and separate the myth from the fact, my process while working on the book and you know later extended into the film was I would basically start from square one. I had the original newspaper coverage and I had the Rolling Stone article and a few news pieces and I just jotted down the names of the people who were quoted in them and looked these people up and the ones who were still alive and willing to talk to me you know they would tell me something like for example the grave robbing aspect of this story the story that the press latched on to was well, Ricky Casso was arrested two months before the murder because he broke into a 19th century graveyard and dug up a skull and a hand to sell at a magic shop in New York. And then I find out from people, they were like, well, yes, Ricky did get arrested for grave robbing, but the story about the skull and the hand, that didn't happen to him. That happened to another kid in Northport six <laughs> months before that. Turns out there was a bit of a teenage grave robbing problem in Northport at the time. Yeah. And it was a different friend of Ricky's. And yes, he, he, well, he didn't dig it up out of the ground, but his friend stole his head and a hand from a crypt, uh, a mausoleum. And it was to sell to a, a magic shop in New York. I believe they would make like a like a bowl out of the skull or something like that. Yeah. And uh, as far as Ricky went, Ricky tried to get into a grave because uh, another fellow drug addict in Northport, uh, this Vietnam veteran by the name of Pat Toussaint, he had kind of gotten in Ricky's head and said, oh, yeah, we should go to... Uh, the Amityville Horror House, which was only about a half hour away from Northport, and uh, you should you should dig up a skull, and we could do a ritual to Satan on on Walpurgis Nacht, which is you know this satanic holiday in some people's minds. And Ricky went to the graveyard with a shovel and dug and dug and dug and dug, and dug like we talked about in the film and the book, and he found nothing. So he got bored and he went home. But those two stories got mixed together. Yeah. And as far as confirming it, instead of it just being a simple case of he, well, the newspaper said this, but, you know, hey, Ricky's friend I interviewed said that's not true. I went to the police and through the Freedom of uh, Information Act, I made an information request for the original arrest reports. And sure enough, his arrest reports, you know, it was the same thing Ricky's friends were saying. No, he didn't find anything. The skull in the hand was a different kid. And, you know, he had a pending court date at the time of the Lowers murder. And also from the police reports, you get things like the names of the arresting detective. And so I interviewed him for the book and we interviewed him in the film. So it's basically um, you almost have to become a detective yourself with stories like this. You've got to go back to the original archive documents. You've got to get names you got to re-interview everybody. Like you're, you're putting your own case file together. And then see where that information leads you. And it all kind of branches out into a million uh, little branches on this very uh, very messed up, spooky tree of a story. Yeah. And Jesse, also, you talked about approaching people to, to talk to them about the case. Do you find that most people are willing to talk to you when you approach them? Or do you find sometimes that some people are a little bit hesitant because of the way their stories have been portrayed in the past? There there was definite hesitancy, but by complete chance, I interviewed the right handful of people first. Um, As I mentioned uh, before, the Rolling Stone article about this case 
which was very well done because David Breskin didn't just, you know, spend an hour in North or, you know, just printing hearsay. He was working on the story for several weeks there and gained the trust of all these kids back in 1984, only hours after the story broke. And I got a few names from the Rolling Stone piece, and one of them was Anthony Zankis, who was also an executive producer on the film. And Anthony, at the time, was a friend of Gary Lauer's. He knew Ricky, but wasn't close to him. Um, but in the years since he was interviewed for that story, he has become a professor of social work in New York at Columbia University and Adelphi. So interviewing him first and making it very clear to him that I believed him when he said, you know, the press got this all wrong, and especially that book, Say You Love Satan, I told him, I said, well, listen, I, I have no interest in regurgitating bullshit facts. Tell me the true story, and let's get the true story out there. Let's write a wrong here. And because Anthony had made something of himself, and his opinion on these things was taken very seriously by his peers because he was a social worker now, I was able to interview a lot more people than I think I would have if I hadn't approached him first. Yeah. Because he was able to go back to everyone and say, hey, I've spoken to this guy. He's writing a book. He understands that, you know, all that stuff before was complete crap. He wants to hear the real story. And, you know, Sale of Satan won't be the final word on this case. And I out of 10 people trusted him on that. So he, he really, really helped open the doors there. That's awesome. And Jesse, I guess to finish up now, cause we're running out of time very quickly. Um, what would you like to say to people out there before they sit down and watch this documentary? I think, uh, I would really tell people that if you're looking for a, a, a grisly, gruesome, A to Z telling of a horrific murder. You might want to look elsewhere, but if you want to see a very um, well thought out presentation of a really disturbing and bizarre incident that led to one of the most bizarre social panics, not just in America, but around the world, and see how uh, a simple misunderstanding can turn into a huge media myth that can then turn into a witch hunt against an entire generation of children, you should definitely check this film out because there is so much more to the story than a spooky kid in an ACDC shirt getting arrested for murdering a friend over stolen drugs. This led to some really, really crazy things that are honestly still going on today. The satanic panic of the 80s and the 90s is still very relevant. We're just seeing a different flavor of it now. Definitely. Well...